Good evening. Uh, thank you for coming. And I think, you know, it's funny, this is the sixth time I've done this uh, for the BRI. And it's either last, thank you, either the last three or four years per contract. So it's been a while. And you can always tell, you can always tell when the committee does a good job. The room's a little smaller, it's a little quieter, there's not as many people. And that's, that's usually a good sign. Uh, while we like to have everyone come and, you know, listen, it's always a good sign. People usually don't come when they're happy. They usually come when they're not happy. So I'm hoping you're happy, but if you're not, I'm okay with that too. Uh, as Albert said, we had, for the most part, we had the same committee this go-around as we did the last go-around. And while it's nice to get new blood in and get new ideas, there's something to be said of having the same committee for the most part, a couple of years in a row. You get used to each other, you can work a little more efficiently, and you can work a little better, really. Um, so we did a four-year deal, and before we started, we took a survey of all the managing agents and owners, co-op people, and we said, what does the average employee that works in a BRI-covered building earn? And that came out to $40,300 per year. So based on that, we said, how does that compare, and who can we compare it to? And we can't really compare it to the RAB, which covers New York City, because New York City is its own animal. You know, the real estate prices in Manhattan, they didn't really hit the recession that we did. It's just a different place. And so we tried to look. Then we said, well, what about the Bronx? The Bronx really isn't comparable either because the vast majority of the Bronx, with the exception of the Riverdale section, the vast majority of Bronx is covered by lower income, one employee buildings without the services that people demand and expect in Westchester. So we looked at them, we also looked at Co-op City. Again, it's not really comparable, but there's not that many groups that are. So we looked at Co-op City, and just as an example, uh, the New York City employees average much higher than us, as we would expect. Uh, the Bronx people average much lower than us, which would we, we would expect. The Co-op City people average 44,000. And I, I thought that was a little strange. I didn't think they'd be higher than us. I thought they'd be lower. Um, not really sure yet what that means, but it definitely means something. I just got to figure it out. Uh, but what we did was we went into it. We went in on the back of New York City. So New York City went first, and then it was our turn to negotiate. And oftentimes that's hard, because comparatively we're a very small group compared to the REB in New York City. The REB in New York City covers a lot more employees, they have a lot more money, uh, the negotiations are a lot more intense. So we go into that on their back. The biggest problem we have is the REB in New York City now is dominated by builders and investors. It's not dominated by owners. Um, and you know, you would think, well, what's the difference? The difference is the investors got a clear message from the new administration that they need to have a sharing of the wealth. I'm sure in the mayoral, um, the mayoral candidates, you heard a lot, of, a lot of back and forth, but there was a lot of, this is a city of two cities, of two people, the have and the have nots. And there was a lot of pressure put on builders that if you want things to go smoothly for you when you're building that new high rise on 44th Street, you better share the wealth. And the investors don't care because what they say is by the time an employee comes in and by the time the employees, employees are hired, I'm out of here. I'm going to convert the building. Half the building is pre-sold already. The rest will be sold by the time I'm done and I'll leave it with the co-op or condo. It's their problem when I'm leaving. Do whatever you want. I gotta get this built and I gotta get my permits in place. We don't have that problem here. Uh, so, we'll get on wages. What we did was, we went into that. New York City had an 11% increase over the course of four years. And we aimed to beat that. Co-op City had a 10.5% increase. So going into this, we were thinking, well, most likely the union's gonna be looking for us to go somewhere in between those. Somewhere between 10 and a half and 11%. You know, we're not as low as Co-op City, but we're definitely not as high as New York City. 
So we came out with a total of 9.27% over four years. And the breakdown of that was 2.58 the first year, 2.5, 2.4, 1.79 .4, in the fourth year. And, you know, frankly, I was surprised to do that well. Uh, a lot of it had to do with our group really standing, standing strong and standing up to the union. And basically the last few days of our negotiations, willing to walk away, uh, which we did not think the union would be willing to do. So that's a full percent and a half, percent and a quarter, excuse me, lower than New York City, and it's a full percent and a half lower, sorry, Co-op City, it's a full percent and a half lower than New York City, and that's very good. As an example, the average in the Northeast for union contracts is about 4% per year. Uh, countrywide, it's about three and a half. So we beat all the averages, and we beat even our local constituents compared to those. Health coverage. October 1 of this year, which was the anniversary of ours, we had no increase. We pushed the increase back to January 1, and it was for a yearly increase, it was three and a half percent. Second year, we stuck with the January 1 date, so all our years are pushed back a few months. The second year was 3.7%, 4.8%, and in 2018, their actuaries did not have a number yet, but what we were able to do was, we were able to negotiate a maximum number. So no matter what happens, it won't be any higher than a 6.4% increase. And for anyone who has any dealings with health coverage today, whether it's at your place or if you own a place, and or if you're going out shopping for health coverage on yourself, you know that a three and a half to three, seven, four, eight percent increase per year is phenomenal. Uh, the averages are somewhere around 15 percent right now. So we're very proud of that. Pension, we did not have a lot to deal with in the pension. And the reason is the pension plan is still being covered by the Pension Protection Act and it's mandatory 7% increases. The one thing we were able to do was push the increase back from October 1 of this year to April 1 of next year. Uh, six month, you know, if you push back an increase six months, it's really as if you're saving 50% of the increase. We were able to manipulate the date a bit. We could not manipulate the amount. So it's 7% per year. The SRSP was a 0% increase. The legal and training funds were a 0% increase. And at the end of the day, when you're looking at the total cost increases of what your employees going to cost you in addition each year, we had 2.8% year one, 3.5% year two, 3.7% year three, and 3.3% in year four. Uh, again, Northeast average is about 16% or 4% per year. So we did pretty well. Uh, we had an overall increase of 13.3%. That is one of the lower contracts. Uh, you can go on 32BJ's website. You can pull off all the other contracts they have from Maryland up to Boston, and ours is the lowest increases of any of those. So we're pretty proud of those. Um, as important, or possibly in some cases more important, it's always about money. Every time somebody says it's not about the money, it's about money. But there's also several changes in the contract that make living with union employees much easier. And it makes day-to-day -day life much easier with your managing agents would appreciate. And some of the things that have forever have ticked people off, I'll say. Uh, they come up every couple of years. We try to deal with them as we can. But there's been some ongoing issues that we've had. And over the last several negotiations, we've been whittling away. And I think we finally slayed the dragon. Um, Performance-based bonuses, they've been, according to language that was about 40 years old, they, once you gave a performance-based increase or a performance-based bonus, you were stuck. And the men would claim that was a prior better condition, and therefore they're entitled to it every year. We've got that removed. So performance-based bonuses are a yearly thing. If you've given the bonus every year because you were forced into it, you no longer have to. A bonus is a bonus. If you want to give it, you're free to give it. If you don't, you don't have to. One of the biggest issues we've always had has been painting, spackling, and patching. There's always been restrictions, and over the years we've been able to move that restriction. I think when I started it was two square feet, you know, roughly this big. 
Uh, we've got that eventually up to the last go round. It was 16 square feet, which was just under the size of a door, which really made it annoying <laughs> because you couldn't make the men paint the door. And that's been an ongoing issue. This go round, we got that removed. The last go round, we had all the work rules removed. I don't know if any of you remember, there used to be those six or seven pages and it itemized everything you can ask a man or woman to do. And if it wasn't on that list, they could say, not my job. We eliminated those, but the painting, patching, and spackling stuck, uh, stuck and it stayed on. And this time we were able to get that removed. We removed all restrictions regarding painting, spackling, or plastering, with the exception of painting apartments um, for just the change of color or its time. Um, if you, for cosmetic reasons, if there's damage in there or in common areas, if you want to have general upkeep, common doors, uh, doors to apartments that face common hallways, just about any, painting of lobbies, painting of hallways, painting of elevator doors and bucks, you can have the men do that. There's no restrictions on that. Uh, that is probably the thing I heard the most about from our end. When we had any open meetings, that was probably the number one work rule that really challenged us because that is a cost savings that you can really see. You know, if you can go out, you may not want your men to paint your lobby, they may not be good enough, but to do touch up, to do your doors, to do your elevator doors, your common area doors, entrance doors, you know, instead of having to go out and hire a company to do that every year or every other year, you can now have your men do that. And that doesn't really require a high level expertise to do that. Um, arbitrations, this was another area where we heard a lot of input, uh, I'll put it as input, a lot of complaints, was the amount of time it took for the union to file arbitration. We were able to get the time to file a grievance, so this is by the man, to file a grievance, we reduced that time by 33%. So if you took an action against the man, he had 45 days to file a grievance. We got that reduced to 30 days. So the minute you give him a suspension, a termination, something along those lines, the clock starts ticking. He's got 30 days to file a grievance. If he doesn't meet that deadline, it's waived. The grievance is over, you've won. What we had after that was we have, the union had 30 days from a meeting. We always have that step one meeting. The meeting would take place between the manager or management representative, the union, and they try and work something out with the man, figure out why was he disciplined, what happened, uh, what was the grievance about, and the union had 30 days to then file a grievance. So you could conceivably be two and a half months into this and you haven't even filed for arbitration yet. We got that time reduced by 50%. The union now is 15 days from that meeting to file a grievance. And the whole idea of this is to get things moving. If there's a grievance, let's get going, let's hear it. Um, I think that's gonna, that's gonna be a big, a big benefit to all our employers. When you take an action, you don't want this thing hanging around. You wanna get it done. Uh, some of the other things, small items that always cause the problem, our contract had unused sick time paid out on October 1 of the year. And every year I must field, and I know Jeff would field, dozens of questions of, well, what happens if we pay out the man his unused sick time on October 1, and on October 15th he takes a sick day? Well, he's already used his sick time because you paid it out, so you deduct pay. Then the man comes in yelling, why did you deduct a day's pay? You know. I was sick, I have sick time, and then you have to sit down and explain to them, well, you've been paid out all your sick time, you have none left till next year. So we got that moved to February of the following year. So for, if they don't use any of their sick time, you pay it out the next year uh, in February. The other thing we heard about that was, October 1 was very tough, because it comes at the end of the year, and a lot of times it's the start of the heating season, and a lot of buildings find that time of the year very tough, financially and budget-wise, to find the extra money to pay out the men the unused sick. They don't want to budget for every day, but at the same time, they didn't budget enough, and it was always a question of how much time would they have to pay out, and could they find this money. February 1, what we heard from a lot of co-op condos was, they know what the money, they know what they owe, they can budget for it, and at the change of the year, they'll have the money in the budget and they'll pay for it. 
Uh, from now on, going forward, employees that work less than 16 hours are not covered by the, the agreement at all. So if you have an, um, six, sorry, 16 hours or less. So if you have an employee that works two days, typically a weekend coverage person, this one I find most in one and two man buildings, which is the bulk of our constituency. If you have somebody who works five days and you want coverage on the weekends, under the, the contract that just expired, if the man worked one hour or 40 hours a week, they were covered by the contract. And you had to do everything under the contract as you would for any employee. Now going forward, 16 hours or less, they're not covered by the contract whatsoever. The only provision they're covered by is the minimum wage rate, but nothing else. There's no holiday pay, there's no grievance procedure, there's no probationary period, there's no work rules, nothing. Those employees are at will. You can do with them as you see fit, provided it follows the law. Um, on the back of that, what we have is, you have until June 30th of 2015 to take any of your 20 hour per week employees and move them down to 16. We've had provisions over the years that employees working 20 hours or less did not get fringe benefits. Well, now we're gonna have that you have until June 30th of 2015 to decide if you wanna take those 20 hour people, reduce them to 16 hour, and have them not covered by the contract whatsoever. So if you have any 20 hour people, now's the time to start thinking about, do you wanna move them to 16? They will not be able to file a grievance about that. That is totally an employer decision to be made. Some other changes that are big, drug testing. We changed drug testing language. You used to have to bring the man to a site that was pre-approved by both the union and the BRI. Those sites are gone. There's very few places that allow walk-in drug testing. We did a lot of research on this, trying to find places. There's not one in Westchester County. All you have to do now is use state-of-the-art testing. State-of-the-art testing, as I see it, could be a breathalyzer. Uh, you could, pretty much anything you want that you can consider breath, uh, state-of-the-art. It's gonna make drug testing of employees much easier. In the past, you used to have to try and make an appointment, drive to the employment site, get the employee, get them in your car, drive them, wait for the testing to be done, drive him home, wait. And then a lot of times you couldn't drive him back to the site and let him drive home because if you felt that he was in, intoxicated or under the influence of drugs and you dropped him off at his work site and said, okay, go home, and he drove home and got in an accident, there could be a theory of law that would find you to be responsible for that. So a lot of times employers were very reluctant to do any drug testing because of how hard it was and how many hurdles. Now it becomes a lot easier. Um, independent contracts. The BRI is now going to review all independent contracts quarterly. So any contract the union makes with an independent employer, maybe you have a building that's near you that doesn't belong to the BRI, and they tell you, well, we've got a much better deal. We went out on our own and did a better deal. That's not going to happen anymore. We've dramatically strengthened our most favored nations clause. And by a most favored nations clause, what we mean is any contract in Westchester County where an employer goes out and gets a better deal than we have, and we find out about it, we're automatically entitled to that better deal. So we're gonna be doing a quarterly review of any independent contracts. We're gonna go through them, we're gonna make any notations, and if there's anything better in those contracts, we're gonna immediately protest that and we're gonna ask the union to give us that benefit that whatever somebody else may have negotiated. Uh, that's a big thing because, as you know, if you talk to everybody in the room, everybody's situation is a little different. Westchester County covers buildings that are high-rise with one lobby, high-rise with multiple lobbies. We cover low-rise low buildings. We cover garden style. We cover single entrance, multiple entrance, acres and acres of land, very little bit of outside land. So there's always something a little bit different. And I think that's going to be something that's going to be really interesting. When we go through and we look at some of these independents that maybe have pulled out in the past to try and get a, not necessarily a better deal, but a more tailored deal to their units and their, their position, we can maybe start to pick and choose what we want out of those, and we can start to get that into our deal. I think that's going to be big. 
And one of the last things we eliminated was those building site addendums. For any of you who ever dealt with those, after we negotiated the contract, the BRI and the union would prepare these building site addendums. They were different colors depending on the year. They would send them and they would list the number of employees you have with the current wage rate plus the wage increase put in for the three years or four years and you would have to sign them. I would say probably 65% of those were incorrect because nobody would update the BRI over the years. Oh, that employee left two years ago. The new person come in, was hired at a different rate. We never changed that rate. And this would go on, literally it would go on for two to three years, going back and forth, trying to make the changes, make the corrections. And then it, just when you finished getting that done, it was time for a new contract. We've eliminated those. No longer have to deal with those. Uh, the, your boards don't have to deal with them. Owners don't have to deal with them. Your managing agent doesn't have to deal with them. The BRI doesn't have to deal with them. And, you know, you might think, well, so what? What's the big deal of that? You have to look at the totality of it. And in the contract, there was lots of reference to those building site addendums. One of the references that we needed to do away with was in that, in the language it said, no employee shall be paid less than what is referred to in the building site addendum. Now that was never enforced by the union until a couple of months ago, the union filed a grievance against one of our BRI buildings. And it was before the contract expired. The building's superintendent had retired. He had been there 30 plus years. He made well above what the minimums were. Over the course of the years, they paid him extra raises, they gave him bonuses, they increased his pay because he had been there so long, had been such a good employee. The union took the position that, hey, the building site addendum says no employee can be paid less than what's listed above. Our building site addendum lists what that outgoing employee paid. Anybody who comes in has to be paid the same amount. And according to the strict language in the addendum and the contract, they had an argument. Now, we were preparing an arbitration saying that's not the way the parties bargained over the years and that's not the history of bargaining between the parties. But it was an argument I didn't want to get into because the strict language, under the strict language, they were correct. Now, you know, having dealing with the union all the time, I could tell you I had some short words uh, and a terse conversation with the union delegate who brought this grievance, because basically I said, look, I've been involved in this contract since 1991 on one side or the other, and that's never been brought up. That's never been the intention of the parties, and it's been done in thousands of cases. Why are you bringing this up? And his response was, well, it's in there, and I've been told to go through this contract and pull out anything I feel like pulling out. So, you know, going into the negotiations, I kept that quiet, that grievance quiet, and we were able to overturn that language. I'm not sure the union realized it. We went at it with the approach of this building site addendum is always incorrect. This building site addendum causes more problems than it helps. And that's how we got rid of it, because they agreed with that. Um, just to let you know, I got a call yesterday. The union withdrew that grievance. I pointed out the change in the language. And they said, OK, I guess we have no case. Uh, they withdrew it. So, you know, when you think of small, small changes to language that you think may not help or may not mean anything, there's always, it's like a spider web. It's always connected somehow, and it's finding out how it's connected. That's, that's where you really make up, and that's where you find out some of these language changes maybe have more effect on the contract than the outright wage increase or, <coughs> wage or health and welfare, things like that. Uh, those are the most significant changes to the contract. There were some cleanup of language things that really don't affect anything. If there's any questions, comments, I'm here. Do we have any questions? Uh, just to stand up and just identify yourself so uh, we can begin. Yeah, I'm thing. the president of the co-op Rockbridge House. I need to start still having you. Question. On formal evaluation, yearly formal evaluations, do we have carte blanche on that? In other words, can we carry on a formal evaluation on our staff? Absolutely. You're the employer. You can evaluate your staff. You set the tone. You set the standards. It's up to them to live up to them. The only time the union can get involved is if, if the men file a grievance stay, thinking that you filed on reasonable terms. 
And, you know, I always say to employers, and I say it to the union, and I say it to the men, they're paid for eight hours a day, you're entitled to eight hours of work in a day. If what you ask them to do would take nine, ten hours, and you're saying you have to get it done in eight, that's unreasonable. But I can guarantee you very few of the men work eight straight hours in a day. It's up to you to set the tone. Also, if I just add, as a, as a broad general rule, let's say if anything like that led to an arbitration or whatever, obviously your evaluation, the, the, in general, every arbitration case is unique, but in general, the person who goes with the biggest stack of documentation yes. uh, has certainly the weight of evidence on their side. So, so you know, in that spirit that, you know, your evaluation is the follow-up, everything, the more you document, uh, the better it is. Yeah, I, I completely agree. You know, um, every year or so, I'll give a speech to the BRI on how to, how to deal with a problem employee. And, you know, I've been saying it for, I don't know, too long. But it's still true. I start off every time saying, if it's not in writing, it didn't happen. You know, no matter how many times you go in, I can't tell you how many times I've had employers, not just in this industry, in all types of industry, come to me and say, this guy or gal, they've been a pain in the rear end for 15 years, i got to fire them. And I'll say, okay, give me the employee file. Well, we don't really have anything on them. And when I used to be on the union side, I used to love that because what I used to say to the employer was, this, pro this person's been in a problem employee, yes. And how long? Oh, very long time. And they've been terrible? Oh, terrible. And, you know, they would screw up oh, all the time. I'd say, can you show me some of the write-ups? And they'd say, well, we don't have it. I said, well, they couldn't have been that bad. You didn't bother to write them up. How bad could they have been? You know, so it's true. Do most co-ops do evaluations? From your experience? Like a yearly evaluation? Yeah. No. I, I think they should, but they don't. You know, I would say maybe 10% from what I've seen do. Uh, I don't think it's a bad idea, but it's a matter of somebody taking the, the bull by the horns and doing it. Next question. Both. Because I, I can only vouch for my, for my staff, um, the old timers seem to really stick to what's written in you know, black and white, and I yeah. just want to know if they're going to be aware of these changes. Of yeah, we just completed, about a week ago, uh, the attorney for the union and I just completed the final draft. Um, and we just got it on Friday signed by the union. So we were very reluctant to release anything in writing until we had all the language changes in the contract. Um, I do have a little breakdown of what I talked about, which I'd be happy to give you. I have 30 copies, which will cover everyone. Um, I'd be happy to give you that so you can just tuck it away. But we're going to do the little booklet. You know, the little, We'll probably have that printed within the next month, and that will go out to everybody again. I'm more concerned for them. Yeah, they'll be able to get, once we, once we get the contract back to them signed, it'll go on 32BJ's website, and they should be able to provide their, employee, their members with copies of the contract. Uh, the other thing you can do is, are we going to release it by, via email, the well, contract well, itself? Have, I, the, the, we can do it several ways. Now, yeah, we'll definitely the do the booklet. The booklet's going to be ready in a couple of weeks. Or yeah. Today. Uh, now, if anybody would like a, an eight and a half by, the booklets are like, uh, you know, uh, three by four or something. They're very handy and important or whatever. But if anybody would like an eight and a half by eleven copy, uh, just contact the office, Jeff or me, and uh, we can get them. Yeah, we'll email it. We can get them basically a copy of the of, of the, the contract. Sign, of the sign yep. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, the eight and a half by eleven. But we can, we can, yeah, what, what I would well, propose uh, is, you know, what we could do, Albert, is we could give them a copy of the signed memo of agreement, which outlines just the changes and the actual contract itself. Because sometimes you look through the whole contract, you, you know, you don't want to sit there going page by page. So we could give them the MOA and the agreement itself. That'll outline every change that's made. Anything else? Any questions? Uh, okay, uh, ladies first, and then this gentleman. Okay. Okay, Mary Milan, Treasurer of Bronxville Garden Apartments. Uh, just a couple of questions on the um, 
on the drug testing, is that something that's mandatory upon employment and later on during the year or any time that you think it might be an issue, who is it that does this test now that's easier? Is it the management agent and can it be done at any time that you might be suspicious about it or is it just a time of employment? No and yes. No. <laughs> um, it is not mandatory. You eat, you're allowed to drug test at the time of hiring, but it's really up to each individual corporation to set their own hiring policy. So it's not mandatory that any BRI member drug test, but you're allowed to at the time of hiring. During employment, if you have a reasonable suspicion to believe your employee is under the influence of drugs or alcohol during employment time, you may have them tested. And I would suggest you have your managing agent do the testing, not a board member, not a resident. It provides a little bit of a cushion, and it's also, some of them, if they're in the room, are not going to like it, but it also, it's what you hire them for. You hire them to manage your employees, let them manage the employees. And the other question is on the, um, the unused sick time. I'm still a little confused. If, it's, if the payout for unused sick time is in February, does that mean it's through the calendar year of December? Yes. Oh, okay. So any, let's say 2014, if it, if it got to the end of 2014, the calendar year, and you know I was one of your employees and I had three sick days left, you would pay me out in February. But my clock starts again January 1. So I would get an additional 10 on. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. And just my pet peeve, I'm guessing it wasn't changed because you didn't mention it, but this business that, that I brought up a while ago about all work performed by the employee other than the superintendent in excess of eight hours a day yes. would paid overtime. Is that still in there? It's still in there. And, you know, what you have to think about is the Fair Labor Standards Act and New York State labor law always overrule that. The law always overrules contract. So we can negotiate things that are better. We can't negotiate things that are worse than the law. So the Fair Labor Standards Act still rules. So the Fair Labor Standards Act says 40 hours in a week, you have to pay overtime. Now what that was created to do, I'm going to yeah, explain. I remember, I remember yeah, you remember? The whole purpose of that was to have split shifts for a superintendent, right. which you can still do. And we had... I mean, the fact that it, that it just says everyone but the super is, yeah. gets overtime really makes that... It's archaic. Confusing. I agree. It's, it's archaic. I agree. I completely agree. I don't agree know why they just wouldn't cross out the word. Why I don't know. Would want to open it up we talked place. about it and talked about it. We've talked about it at the last four go-rounds. And they won't change it. And by the time we get to the end of the day, you know, we've always decided we know what it means. We know what the law is. It's really just perfunctory. We're not going to hold up a contract over that. But I, I don't get it either. And I've never, so it's four times now. That was two three-year deals, and now two four-year deals. That's 14 years, and I still haven't gotten a good reason as to why they won't take it out. I don't know. And I brought it up to you Travis did? or Trevor, whatever his name. Yeah. And he said, oh, yeah, we're going to do that. We're gonna do yeah, that. yeah, I know. Okay. Wasn't up to Trevor. Yes. Hi, I'm Rick Tancuri. I, I work with uh, Hudson North Management. <coughs> uh, my question is regarding drug testing. How, how often, and if, the employee shows proof of drugs or drinking, how can you terminate and how does that happen? Okay, so as often as you have a reasonable suspicion, if you go in and drug test every day, at some point somebody's gonna say, wait a minute, you know, especially if it keeps coming up negative, they're gonna say, I think you're harassing this employee. But as a, the, the only caveat is if you have a reasonable suspicion. So as long as you can say, I have a reasonable suspicion, slurring words, bloodshot eyes, smell of alcohol on the breath, inability to walk a straight line, keep balance, those are all things that are indicia of alcohol or drug use. I think those would be reasonable suspicions. Moodiness, even. Um, just to, I'll get to your question, but just to give you an idea, last year I had a case that involved anabolic steroids. They are illegal drugs. You know, we often think of drug use as, you know, cocaine, heroin, marijuana, you know, recreational drug use. Um, but it was anabolic steroids, and the superintendent had been using them for a long time. They wound up affecting his personality, and he would have right rage. You know, he would fly off the handle, he would throw things, he would get violent, and they had him tested, and it came back, he was using um, anabolic steroids. 
So that's a drug too. That's an illegal drug. Um, so, so how often? As often as you have a problem. Now the deal is, if you catch an employee, that's one of the things we did. We put a limit on how many times an employee can go to rehab. If you if you fire an employee for being under the use of alcohol, if they come to you first before you test them and catch them, and they say, "I have a drug problem," you must allow them to go to rehab. If you catch them using it, they have one chance to go to rehab. That hasn't you, changed well, it used to be unlimited. Was it unlimited? Yeah, there was a little quirk in the language that they could just keep going. Now there is a one-time and one-time only basis. So if you catch them, what I always say is, if you catch an employee and they're messing up at work, maybe you don't want to fire them for using drugs. Maybe you want to fire them for messing up, because then they get no chance of going to rehab. If they come in and say, I have a drug problem, you let them go to rehab one time. Okay, but then they come back from rehab and... If you catch them, they're gone. They're done. Yep. If they refuse to go to drug testing, you can terminate. Any other questions? One final question? Yes, sir. Alan, I'm asking you about the Brockman challenge. What criteria is there if you need to terminate somebody because of work performance? Is there some guidelines? Um, we have guidelines for drug... Uh, right. I, there's no set guideline. You know, like, if you're late three times, by this amount of time, you're fired. Um, what it is is, and I, I started to say, you are the employer, you set the tone of what is acceptable or not. And, you know, there are there is reasonableness to that, but I think the best way to do that is to have evaluations, to have weekly or monthly inspections, weekly maybe a little over, but ha have work tickets and have a time when that work ticket is given to your employee and when the work was performed. You know, is that a reasonable amount of time to get that work done? Is there a reasonable amount of work being done? And one of the things I advise all the employers I deal with is to have the employees fill out logbooks. And for those who remember, you remember the black and white notebooks from when you were young, those simple black and white notebooks? Those are the best things. They're 99 cents in the dollar store. Go buy them, have the employee open it, put the date on the top, and put down what he or she did that day. And you know, a lot of times, there's several reasons I ask them to do that. Number one is if they're not doing anything, and there's tick work tickets that haven't been done, or it's dirty, or there's things that need to be repaired, and you look in their logbook and they haven't done anything, they have no excuse for not doing it. Another reason is, Maybe you're entitled to a staff reduction, because if there's not enough work to fill the work day, then maybe you don't need as much staff as you have. And lastly, a lot of times you'll see the employees just put things in there that they don't do, particularly the bad employees, and that's how you catch them. And that's a terminable offense, which is falsifying a record. You know, if they put in, you know, November 18th, you know, Tuesday, November 18th, I did X, Y, Z. And you look at the book, and you, and you look and you say, you didn't do this. It's not done. They falsified a document to you, and you could terminate. You lost trust in them to prepare documents that you rely on. So, you know, I think that's the best way to do it. It's simple, it's effective, and it's easy. And it, again, you know, one of those marble notebooks will cost you 99 cents, probably has 100 days in it. If you go back in, back in front of the page, you got 200 days, you know. Uh, that's the best way to do it in monthly inspections. Just do a walkthrough. Your board can do it. Your managing agent can do it. Walk through the building with a clipboard and just make a note of things that should be done in the course of regular business. Garbage on the floor, stairwells need to be cleaned. Uh, you know, I could tell you a million things over the years I've heard. You know, a tissue that was laying in the lobby for a month. You know, nobody picked it up. Simple stuff. But there's other things too, you know, and I think now with the expansion of these work rules, there's really no excuse not to have the men you know, do some work. You could do the painting, the patching, all that stuff. Just a quick yeah. question about the painting. That holds true for the, for the super, any um, yes. porter? Yep. Either one of them can Yep. Do Just remember, when your porter does work that's in a pay grade above him, handyman or superintendent work, he has to get paid the hourly rate of that person. Well, how, how do you know what's in their pay grade? Porters typically clean and assist. If they're actually doing the painting or spackling, that would more like be handyman work. So, you know, you just need to look at... That would be a performance bonus? That would be a rate per hour change when he does it? 
When he does it, it's a rate per hour, not a bonus. If you feel if you feel you want to give a bonus, feel free, but you don't have to. Oh, so it's a different rate per hour. Yeah, in the contract, there's minimum wage rates, so you'll just have to pay. Yeah, you'll just have to pay the porter. Like, let's say you want the porter to do painting. That's not porter work typically. Typically, that is handyman or superintendent or utility man work. So you just need to look in the contract, see what the minimum rate is, and make sure he gets paid that rate. Any other questions? Well, listen, thank you, Matt. All right, thank you. Thank you. I would like to say at parting, <coughs> excuse me, that um, uh, we'll probably have another one or two of these as we get into the new year. And uh, on behalf of my colleague, Jeff Hanley, I want to thank you again for coming out. Don't forget Thursday's meeting with Richard Ravitch. We'd love to have you come and see Jeff about it. Uh, hopefully you've got your parking passes uh, validated with the sticker. If not, uh, see Jeff. And uh, see you at the holiday party. So safe home, everybody. Thanks for coming out on a cold uh, evening. Take care. Ciao.